of Board Gamers Anonymous, a podcast about gamers and the insane fun we have at the table together. This is Anthony. This is Chris. This is Daniel. This is Drew. Welcome to the episode, everybody. Episode 28. This week we're going to talk about a few of the games we've been playing lately and some of the changes coming to Board Gamers Anonymous. Yay! Uh, last episode, big announcement, obviously, we've joined the uh, Dice Tower Network, so we've Woo-hoo! been... <laughs> the obligatory woohoo. Uh, we're looking at ways that we can make things a little more interesting on the site. So uh, if you haven't actually checked out the website lately, you should because there are now some articles up there. Um, we're all going to be trying to add some more content, more than just show notes, which has been all that's been on the site for the last nine months, plus our gift guide. Uh, so um, we're all going to try to throw something a little unique in there. You know, I like to write just kind of general fun stuff. I think the last article I wrote. Um, before recording this was like my May playlist, what I've been playing lately. Um, working on a couple lists, like top ten-ish kind of lists. Um, and I know Daniel, Drew, Chris, you guys are working on some cool stuff too. I've, I'm the old guy. I love bringing old games into the 21st. We're in the 22nd century, are we? No. Well, I'll take them <laughs> into the 20, I'll, I'll take them into the 22nd century if you want. Bring them up to date. Book Rogers and Drew in the 22nd <laughs> century. <laughs> Playing board games for some reason. (laughs) I'm going to be running a series called Mind Games where we'll be looking at board games from an academic point of view. I'll be looking at recent work in psychology, anthropology, about the way that games have shaped us and the way we shape games, uh, and hopefully be able to keep it from getting too esoteric. And I'll also be talking about games as a global community, what you get out of it, what you give to it, the, the players that play together, and how the games kind of change your lives and benefit your lives as far as learning mechanics in games that actually benefit you in making decisions as far as strategy and tactics, and also about how bringing real life into games can kind of bring us all together. Yeah, so check those out. Uh, if you've been on the website once and all it was was show notes, come back. There's more stuff now. We're working on it. Uh, leave comments. Get in the conversation. You know, we these things. When you start writing articles, you start having these conversations. Becomes like a you know a multi way conversation. Yeah, and this podcast is here for you. We're having this discussion and bringing you a seat down at the table so that you can join us. So if there's anything you'd like to talk about, any questions, conversations you'd like to have, that's what we're here for. Just let us know. Come to the podcast. Come to the Facebook page. Come to our web page and get get started with the community. Yep, absolutely. All right, so let's dive into some news of sorts. Um, this is the obligatory Star Wars, Star Trek update edition of <laughs> Board Gamers Anonymous. I don't even feel like this is news anymore. It's not it, news anymore. It happens like every two or three months, <laughs> but but then I get excited, so I want to talk about it. Uh, I think, so Star Trek's on wave five, right? Yes. Um, so it's already lapped X-Wing, despite a, a one-year delay on them. Like, they've only been up for nine months on wave five. It's true, and WizKids, even with their own delays, have continued to pump out content, and this really has been the wave that everyone's been waiting for, because now we're in that whole Voyager arc television series, and the Borg have now shown up. So we talked about previously, you had the previous wave, I think it was Wave 4, with the spear, and everyone was really kind of stoked about this, because not only was it this iconic, massive, evil enemy, the Borg, But the ships moved incredibly different, the cards were insanely powerful, and it was something different for the game. So, you know, maybe you played six, seven, eight, nine months into the game, now is here something new to keep kind of keep things fresh. Chris, if I could just offer one correction to what you were saying, you you said that everyone was excited uh, about this, (laughs) and uh, I I just want to let you know there's one exception at this table. Why gotta be like that? Yeah, and then I'm just going to keep talking about miniatures then, so just to rub it in. Uh, (laughs) X-Wing Wave 4, um, you know, it's on the horizon. The thing about Star Wars and the reason that their waves are not quite caught up is because they do the intermittent larger ships, which Star Trek cannot do because the scale will be ridiculous, and they've already done these giant ships with the small ships, and it would be really confusing. Whatever, Wiz kids, do your thing. Um, (laughs) Fantasy Flight's bringing us these big, amazing, awesome, incredibly overpriced models that I want. So, uh, the... The uh, freighter's out, the uh, Carillion Corvette should be out any time now, and then um, Wave 4 is going to... They're really digging in now, because we're well beyond what's in the original trilogy movies. Yeah, now we're in the expanded universe, and... Which is not even canon anymore. It's getting a little weird. So these aren't even real ships anymore, because Disney said they're not real. It's true. And if the mouse says so... They're just making it up. Can we blame this on J.J. Abrams? Is that... uh, Sure. It's his fault. Why not? 
Blame it for lens flare. Blame for everything else. Ooh, lens flare. That would be a great card to play in the game. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, yeah, wave four. Let's see what we got. Uh, Z95 Headhunter, which is... This was actually a great card. I remember back in the old Star Wars CCG days. So this was a pretty cool card back then. Um, you still have that game? I still, I still have a, a pretty sizable collection of the CCG. Dude, bring it out. I've got R2-D2 in Red 5. Dude, I love that game. Yeah. I had all sorts of... I sold them off when they were still worth something. And in Aww. retrospect, the game is <laughs> not very good, but... <laughs> Do you have Wedge? Uh, I think I might actually have Wedge. Wedge. He's not going to be in the new movies. Oh, really? He said, yeah, they're not bringing him for Aww. the new movies. Yeah, because the part f- wasn't big enough. They offered him a part, and it wasn't big enough. <laughs> He's my favorite character, too. I know. I he survives it. everything. He does. It's like... His if five you... seconds of the movie were, like, the most exciting part. I know. It's, he's like the reverse Boba Fett. He actually does awesome <laughs> things in the movie, he, and he survives the entire way, and then no one cares about him, as opposed to Boba Fett, who spends five minutes on screen, then falls in a hole and dies, and becomes a hero to many. <laughs> or does he? <laughs> That's true. Actually, Expanded Universe doesn't count anymore, so yeah, he's dead. Yeah, how about, he's dead. How about... <laughs> he's dead! Well, how about the Christmas special? Ooh, <laughs> that true. never counted. That's true. <laughs> we'll never speak of it again. That was a nightmare from which we have not yet woken up. <laughs> oh my goodness! All right, so yeah, there's a uh, E-wing tossed in there. We've got all sorts of other stuff. We have got that crazy looking Z-wing. Um, it's a cool looking wave. I don't know when it's going to come out exactly because Fantasy Flight just kind of rotates their release dates on like WizKids, which despite delays will actually give you a date. Yeah, it's pretty consistent as far as that's concerned. The one thing about WizKids that now has been cropping up is this uh, you know the continuous idea of power creep so mm. you've seen this kind of in magic and some other yeah. games with where you have this com- collectible component to it which is why should i buy the new blank now because i already have x amount of things so what the companies tend to do is to produce better ships better cards that it's almost impossible at least in tournament play to win unless you have this equipment so right now if you're on board game um BBG or any other board game website, what you're hearing a lot now is people going, yeah, I'm not going to play anymore, or I'm not going to buy anything anymore because Mm -hmm. the power creep has gotten so out of control, especially with the Borg and the new Voyager ship, that it unbalances things a a little bit. At least it definitely changes. So there's been constant threads about um, rage quit throughout the whole thing. Why why doesn't um, Magic just create a dividing line then you've got new magic and magic classic and then you can play separate two separate games well, there are magic tournaments where they say like this run only right kamigawa sure, yeah. only what have you and you could yeah. do that with this the real problem with the voyager ship at least to me is that a lot of the really powerful cards say voyager only so it's not just that it's more powerful it's that you can't mix them back sure. either right so voyager is always going to be one of the most powerful ships on the field yeah now you have the the borg tactical cube is really in this new wave is really what's kind of upsetting people because which we expected it it fits with the universe there's no problem with this they haven't done anything wrong but it's a, a ridiculously power sh- powerful ship with an easy movement template so you can kind of an, even a newbie can kind of get down and play this and the additional cards, which many are either Borg specific, or if you play them outside, would you know you would incur a high penalty, kind of really throw the game a bit, and it's only going to get a little bit worse as time goes on. I think you'd have to spend a lot of time sorting through your cards, like which ones can I use, which ones can I use. Sure. Yeah, that's exactly what happens. And that's the problem too about these games. It's especially WizKids does a tremendous job as, as far as their organized play events and the tournaments, but at the same time, that often kind of forces you into a situation where you're building to either win a scenario or to win a tournament, and not building because, hey, I really like these ships, or I want to do a theme. So I know some places who've been doing OP events have started to do ship pure events so that it could kind of limit the craziness as far as the combos cards will go. All right, so one more thing, one more announcement I saw. for a game that I really like that I thought was pretty cool is a new version of Summoner Wars is going to be coming out this year. And it's basically what they're doing is they're combining... So there's 16 factions now, and they're combining two into one um, into a new master set. So this is called the Summoner Wars Alliances Master Set. And basically, uh, you're going to have... Each of the factions in this set is a combination of two with a new summoner. So there's the Phoenix Elves and the Fallen Kingdom are together now for the Fallen Phoenix 
There's the filth and the cave goblins are now the cave filth. Um, they're trying to keep it a little thematic, but it's instead of bringing out entirely new factions, which they haven't done in a little while, they've just been doing the second summoners, they're combining some of their existing factions, which probably gets around the whole balance issue. Because I think once you get up to 16, it's kind of hard probably to throw a new one in there without it blowing up the game. Um, so this is, this is Summoner Wars smash up. Yeah, except they're pre-done. Like, you don't get to do it yourself. Oh. Yeah, I know. That would be kind of cool. Uh, these are these are literally new sets. So, And you can play with the other ones. They're supposed to be balanced out with all the existing faction decks. So now we're up to God knows how many decks you could play with this game. But it looks cool. I'm interested. I don't know if I'll pick up a new Master Set, but, you know, it's another 50 bucks. I already have the original. But maybe if they sell these decks separately, i pick up a couple. It'd be pretty cool. Um, I haven't brought this out in forever, actually. We should play it. Because they have a couple new second summoners out. I've been wanting to learn, so let's do it. Yeah, it's a 20-minute game, so there's no reason not to. <laughs> Ironically, those games come out the least frequently because you don't have to plan for them. So you're like, yeah, we'll just play it whenever we have time, and then it never happens. But, uh, so, I mean, that's the news this week. That's uh, some of the stuff we saw on the horizon. And, again, you know, we're going to be talking about all this stuff in more depth on the website. So check out the site. Read up our articles. Um there's going to be a lot of stuff up there soon. So next up, some of our acquisition disorders. Acquisition Disorder Corner. All right, anything look interesting this month, guys? Anything you want to pick up? Well, I'm looking at Star Trek Fleet Captains has a new expansion. Originally, the, the base set came with the Federation and Klingons, and then there was an additional expansion for the Romulans, and now, what I've been hoping about was because of Attack Wing coming out and really strongly featuring, featuring the uh, Dominion, they came out with a Dominion expansion. So, there really isn't much information released about this expansion, but it's going to already expand a really interesting game. If you haven't played before, Star Trek Fleet Captains is different than Attack Wing as far as... It's actually more of a board game as, as far as, like, I guess it's like Castle, Raven, Castle Ravenloft or some of the other D&D games, which is you have these kind of t tiles, these areas that kind of flip open, and then it reveals kind of like a, almost a classic Star Trek episode where something is happening, and based upon your ship and its abilities, you have to kind of resolve the conflict or the issue, and you score victory points as the game goes on. So there's everything from attacking the other different races to... Um, starting star bases to resolving the conflicts to exploring the universes. So really interesting and a nice addition. And actually, it will be able to bring the game up to four players because originally when it started, it was a two-player game and then became a three. But I think it's really going to shine as a four-player game because you really do need the multiple interactions. So that's Star Trek Fleet Captains Dominion expansion. Awesome. Now you got to get out the. Uh, we have the full it's version. We huge. haven't even played that yet. It's it's such a it, it's such a great game. But it has, just like Attack Wing, it has every miniature possible in it. So it has this um, kind of clicks, kind of plastic with the clicks base to it. So it's basically decks and decks of cards. We talked about this because it's like 700 some odd cards because you get to staff your ships just like Attack Wing. And it has the, the tiles, which are really aren't tiles. They're kind of really thinly papered kind of tiles. And... Then you have, like, an enormous amount of ships. I think there's about 50 or so odd ships. So you can field any ship you want. It's not just kind of like, a, hey, here's a token. Look what it's doing. It's it's a real ship on a real click space. Um, so it's pretty amazing to take a look at. And What's the MSRP on that? Well, in the base one, I think originally it was $100. And then I think it dropped to 90 But you can pick it up online for about 60 bucks now. So... And you do get a lot for the you know the price, although the quality of the components is a little iffy. So it's kind of a qual it's the quality takes a little hit, but you do get a great deal of qu quantity on it. Awesome. Yeah. Let's pull that out. I'm like all into Star Trek now because <laughs> swear to God, stupid panel at PAX, man. They give me two free things, I told and now you. I'm like, I want all of it. I want everything. I'm gonna watch what, all the shows over again. That's it. It's acquisition <laughs> disorder, man. Like what happened to me? <laughs> and and the one thing WizKids does, which is just marketing genius, is they once they make a model for one game, they they're using that same exact model and everything. So, the Star Trek Attack Wing, the Hero Clicks, the Fleet Captains, and then several other games. You're just going to have it's just the same model. It's just various 
types of either quality on the on the uh, the paint jobs. That's pretty much it. But it's consistent and sort of blendable. Can you mash mash up their different people lines? Have tr people have kind of done that. They've kind of cannibalized the ships from one game to use in the other game because yeah. of either the paint job was better or because they don't they want the ship in play, but they don't want to pay for pay for it again. Right. So there's been some talk about that how to kind of you know um, translate your cards and your models from one game to the other. Hmm. I like mashups. I hear that, Drew. <laughs> you don't say. That's all you got to do. Get me interested. <laughs> That's awesome. Uh, one game that I've seen, and I think every podcast has talked about this, except maybe us, it, but it's not even out yet, so to be fair, we haven't had a chance to play it. It's called Machikoro. So this is oh, the... Oh, my God. Yeah, it's right? It's such a good game. This, is, this game was big last year. It's out of Japan. It has not been printed in the U.S. yet. I think it's coming to come out around Gen Con this year. Um, everything I see says August. But it's this super simple, quick, 30-minute uh, card drafting city building game. So I've heard people compare it to uh, uh, Settlers of Catan with cards. Yeah. And other people compare it a little bit to Suburbia, but much simpler and faster because of the city building element. Um, it it just looks really fun. I mean, it's just it's quick. You can play with four people. It takes 30 minutes. I think the game's going to cost 30 bucks. So it seems very accessible, too. Yeah, I'm going to make a... A declaration not even having played the game but I think this is going to be one of the best gateway games of the year oh. because you're just looking at a selection of cards almost like Dominion you have all these different stacks out there and then based upon how much money you can raise through the game you're gonna buy certain cards and it's pretty simple it's it's like restaurants and farms and things um, the artwork is really nice I wouldn't say it's an anime style it has kind of that cute cutesy Japanese kind of I don't see any characters. It's just buildings and mountains. and So it's really nice. It's really simplistic to look at, but the graphic design is really nicely done. Mm. And you're buying cards to add your, to your tableau, so you're building kind of like a little bit of an engine. And as you're rolling dice, and the outcome of the dice are either giving you money or you're taking money from other players. So very simple mechanics, really kind of simplistic but challenging and interesting gameplay. And with that random dice element to it, as far as what am I going to roll next, which we always like to see in Catan, you know, um, it's, I think it's going to be a great game. I can't wait to get my hands on it. Well, yeah. I'd love uh, We have a nice selection of Japan themed games or games created in Japan. Takedo is currently my, sure. my love affair. I would love to do at some point in the future a mini show of um, like suggesting a, a theme night sure. of Japanese games. Absolutely. Uh, there's Tokunoko, and there's a lot of great oh, games. Obviously, Love yeah. Letter is originally from yeah. Japan. So you can put together a nice program of games. Oh, we'll this. talk about that in the future. Yeah, absolutely. And Seiji Kadai is releasing games, like seems like every six months. I don't know what the release timing is in Japan. Maybe he's been releasing them for 10 years, and we're just discovering them. But at least once or twice a year, we're getting a new game from him. Um, so it's definitely like the floodgates seem to be opening for these Japanese game designers mm -hmm. in the West, um, and which all the better for us. These games are awesome. The um, I do my shopping, <laughs> I do my shopping at thrift shops, at estate sales, yard sales. Um, I love picking people's closets uh, for my acquisitions. Um, I did pick up one. I'll, I'll talk a bit more about in a future blog post. Scrabble Sentence Cube game. It's from the Scrabble people, and it's um, it's totally different. It's a dice game. You're rolling dice with words on it. You're putting them together and forming sentences. And it's a simple enough game that you can very easily freshen it, bring it up to date, and uh, I'll talk about that with some pictures in uh, a blog post in the future. Awesome. Yeah, it looks interesting. Um, and I like Scrabble in general, but, you know, you're talking about ways to make it different, and that's always fun. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and I know a lot of uh, listeners do the same thing. They go out and buy games, thrift shops, and uh, yard sales, and I'd love to hear about what other people have gotten and uh, some of the old classic games that... Uh, they've dragged out of other people's closets and maybe some of the ways that they freshened up those games yeah absolutely so if you've done that or if you it sounds interesting to you and you plan on doing it let us know what you do i mean also it's kind of cool what you can find at these places so yeah. if you find something really awesome for two dollars i want to know brag about it man yeah. tell us grew you and i ultimate calling fix anime him because i bought the store out of this card when that company went out of business oh, about man. God, it must have, over a decade ago now, I think. 
but I've got the box full of those cards somewhere. Have you ever seen any of those in stores around? Or, I mean, like thrift shops or anything? No. That gone. game disappeared. The, there are two comments on Board Game Geek. One of them is saying that it is totally unplayable. Totally unplayable. And the next saying, here are some rules that make it slightly playable. Yes. This is why you're awesome, because I would read that and be like, well, no, and then just burn them. And you're like, <laughs> challenge accepted. <laughs> Folks, we're going to fix. We break games here, and we fix them. <laughs> Welcome to the Fix Your Game podcast, where we fix your games. Oh, man. All right, so let's move on to some of the stuff we've uh, uh, been keeping an eye on on um, Kickstarter and other crowdfunding sites. So Kickstarter, always something new out there. Um, I think the big news right now in crowdfunding in general is uh, Will Wheaton pulling in, like, what, $1.2 million or something on Indiegogo for um, the next season of uh, Tabletop. Mm-hmm. That's that's big in anybody's books for a crowdfunding uh, campaign, but for a tabletop-related crowdfunding campaign, that's amazing. And there's no miniatures. He did it without <laughs> miniatures. Or Cthulhu. <laughs> so uh, well, it helps that he's so likable. Yeah, that... Yeah, and that you know, I, this show's great. I think it's really good for yeah, the hobby is. in general because it, it brings in new people. You know, people who watch Big Bang Theory or something like I know that guy. Oh, he's playing Pandemic. That's interesting. Um, and there's a certain redhead that goes on the show. Well, know. yeah, she's, she's kind of cool and she kind of does her thing, and you know. So you're just deferring all credit to. You keep saying mention this Will Wheaton guy. I don't know who you're speaking of. <laughs> the host of the show. I don't know. I don't know. Just when the the, the redhead girl shows up, like, just, hey, this is the I just redhead girl. Like, <laughs> 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 oh, hey. I think about eighty percent of the stuff you've been talking on about on this show so far today has been Star Trek related. <laughs> I don't think you can get away with pretending you don't know who Will Wheaton is. <laughs> he never existed. It was an alternate timeline. <laughs> no, but you have to talk about Felicia Day, who's really just a just sunlight in herself as she walks on the show. I mean, Will Wheaton's done a tremendous job, and it just goes to show how far the hobby has come. Who would have thought just three or four years before this that hobby board gaming was kind of an unknown, and now Will Wheaton, through Tabletop, has really brought this kind of unknown, obscure hobby up to the mainstream. And to raise over a million dollars for this is just incredible, and a real credit to him and his entire crew putting together such an entertaining, interesting show that I've even got my family to sit down and watch. Right. So really a great job. Congratulations. I know that the hitting over a million dollars is going to allow him to do an RPG show too. So that should be great huh. with him and some actors and comedians actually running an RPG. That should be really fun. That was one of my favorite episodes when they did the Dragon Age RPG. Sure. Cause it, and they brought the guy who only like wrote it and... It was a little awkward, but towards the end, everybody really got into it. You know, the, the actors, because watching actors role play when they're really into it, it can be a lot of fun. Yes, I mean that's where really the show really does shine. Yeah, and the the interplay and the kind of cutaways. It's almost like watching World Series of Poker. It's like, what does he have in his hand? It's like, oh, he's got, you know, a, a magic missile and a mace of immortality. It's like, oh, he's gonna play that card next. No, he's gonna play that one. So it really kind of really brings you into the show and. Even imagine going to Target and seeing a little label on the games that says, you know, this game was played on tabletop. Yeah. So, really great job. Yeah, it's it's pretty cool. I love the show. Um, another thing I've been keeping an eye on, just a game that popped up on Kickstarter in the last uh, week or so, is uh, Maha Yoda. And this is a card game based on um, ancient Indian lore, um, Hindu lore, and it's to me it's new. It's kind of taking an entirely new set of mythos that. Obviously, it's been around and been, you know, an inspiration for many stories and movies and an entire entertainment mega culture in uh, India. But this is, you know, in terms of the board game industry, it's kind of new. And the game itself looks very interesting. It's, um, I think it's got another month left. So uh, when you listen to this, it'll probably have at least five, six, seven, eight days left. Uh, the the artwork is fantastic looking um you know it's obviously early they're they're working on it but they're already over their funding goal so if you back it you're going to get it you're going to get the stretch goals um it just looks really cool take a look at it it's it's going to be uh if nothing else it's going to be a very clean um attractive looking game with very tight you know quick 
play rule game. Any twists on the uh, the basic mechanic? Anything new? In, uh... It doesn't look exceptionally you know mind blowing in terms of card games. It kind of falls into this new theme lately of these pre built thirty to forty card decks, um, which we've seen a lot of. It just makes it quick, makes it easy. It's not collectible. It's not going to build. The expansions will probably just be extra decks, extra cards. You know, I don't know if, if it's going to go the living card game route, um, or if it's going to be the uh, more um, just set deck kind of a thing like uh, Summoner Wars. But it's not it's not collectible, and it's not like six hundred cards. It's so not, could you be used as a filler in between other games? Yeah, it looks like it's pretty quick and to the point. I mean, obviously, I haven't played it, but there's you know there's a playthrough video on here from Undead Viking, so it shows that it's pretty quick, and that that video is 20 minutes, so it's not like I think the game is definitely not going to be you know overwhelming and time consuming. It's a two player card game, so it's not you know it's one of those quick two player fillers. Something you can jump into, learn it very quickly. Yeah, seems like it. So it's definitely something I'm going to probably back myself just because it's the backing price is pretty low, 20 bucks, and. Uh -huh. Um, should ship this year. Looks interesting. All so right. check it out if you're interested in that kind of uh, mythos. And just one last Kickstarter review, which we are not legally bound to do or forced by gunpoint to do, but our capo de capo, um, Tom Vassell, has his Kickstarter game, Nothing Personal, re-released. That this time it's going to come out with some additional expansions. So he has The Associates and power in, and influence. So if you haven't picked up Nothing Personal, it's still on Kickstarter, and recently he's now going to be including an At The Movies expansion, which brings in kind of movie gangsters into the mix. We've already reviewed this. It's a great game, has a lot of fun interaction. It's definitely something to play with the right group of people who can kind of get along with you backstabbing constantly throughout the game and going, making deals and then breaking deals and knocking out each other's characters, but... Honestly, one of the best games as far as components are concerned and as far as theme because you really do feel like you're in this p constant power struggle and who's going to move up next and what, what should I do? And great artwork, great graphic design. We love this game and really looking forward to the expansions. Yeah, it'll, look, it'll be very cool. We haven't played it in a little while. Um, you got to find the right group of people for it. That's the problem, yeah. Yeah, because it's, it's, it's not the kind of game that you would bring out with people who are not familiar with this type of gameplay sure. because in order to succeed you really do have to kind of make deals that you're going to go back on five seconds later but then at the same time after you make that deal you have to try to make another deal for real in order to kind of move ahead so so just think earl this is earl's kind of game <laughs> earl had an interesting experience with this game i don't know I can't remember if he ended up liking it or not. Like, he did, and then he didn't, and then he did, and then at the end he was like, Well, it depends on which end of the knife you're on, I guess. <laughs> That's the problem with this That's game. That's the problem yeah. with this game. <laughs> if you have a bad experience, it's not going to go well. All right, so next up, let's look at some of the games we've been playing lately. At the table this week. So this last week, we got a game in the mail from uh, North Star Games. It is called Evolution, and this has been a really hot game on Kickstarter the last few weeks. Um, it's going to be up for another uh, couple weeks, actually, after we record this. So you guys can uh, stop in and check it out if you're interested. Evolution is exactly as it sounds. You're playing as various species, and you're trying to evolve them so that they come out on top. Um, the mechanics are relatively simple. You're going to start the game with a uh, hand of cards and one species, and as you play, you're going to either increase body size, population, or add new traits to that species, all with the goal of being able to feed your species. Um, the one wrench that gets thrown in is that there is a carnivore trait that comes out of the deck, and then people can choose to make their species carnivores and attack yours. So there's a lot of balance that goes into, you know, do you put... Uh, resources into body size, so you're harder to eat. Do you put your resources into population, so you're harder to kill off? Do you go straight carnivore and just start tearing everybody apart? Or do you try to build up 10 different species and diversify to the point that it doesn't matter if people eat you? Um, and I feel like we all played it a little bit differently, so we got a feel for each of those possibilities. Honestly, it took me maybe 10 minutes to learn the rules to this um, on the way home from work. 10 minutes to teach it, very quick, relatively simple. So there's a lot of different diversity in terms of how you build up um, your different species as you uh, go through the game, because there's a certain, definitely a certain flow to it. 
Overall, I thought it was, you know, very interesting. I thought the mechanics were pretty tight for a Kickstarter game. I had fun with it. I thought it was interesting. Um, I feel like there was some quirks in terms of the balance between carnivores and herbivores. Um, a couple of the cards felt overpowered. A couple of the card combinations are definitely overpowered. Um, we saw that. But overall, I thought it was a fun experience, and it was pretty quick. It didn't drag on longer than it should have. So the, the lack of balance or the imbalance in some cards didn't really bother me that much. Um, I, I thought what I liked was the variety of ways that you could approach the, the strategies. You could either diversify uh, a number of different species. You could focus on just one very strong species. So different paths to victory. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. The imbalance bothered me quite a bit, actually. Uh, the particular combination was long neck, burrowing, and uh, warning call, which collectively, as long as your population is under two, two or two or less, you are invincible. This, this primary species is invincible, as are the species near it, unless someone gets a special card to, to counter this. Uh, it ends up being an incredibly powerful combination. Those three cards together, and particularly because long neck contributes to. Uh, burrowing, which is a card that you have to have gotten food equal to or greater than your population. So if you have a population of two or less, this essentially makes the species invincible. I found that troubling. The challenge with the combination that Daniel's talking about is since you're able to get food before really anything actually happens, it kind of challenges you because your creature is completely safe. I don't think there is a unburrow card or dig out kind of carnivore card. Well, there's Ambush. You just spend a card and you ignore any other abilities. But that means that the Carnivore is going to be having to expending a lot of resources and will not be able to keep up with your spending rate, right? So they'll have to spend one card just to attack you, but you spend that same card to replenish your population next turn, right? So they can never get ahead of you. The, the challenge, I think, with most of the game, too, was the Carnivores needed to have, an, just like very thematically, needed to have a lot of herbivores or other carnivores out there that were large enough size to feed itself. So start. I, I got the carnivore card to begin with, and then everybody was either pretty small or really well defended, so I wasn't able to grow my carnivore, yeah. and it just kind of held me into that spot. And the idea, I guess, as long as you have the carnivore out, you can be in a situation to take other players' creatures out, but you never really grow large enough to completely take them out because their population just continues to grow. Yeah. And there seems to be a lot of defensive cards that kind of counteract a lot of the predatorial kind of cards in the game. I think the only species we ever took out were one or two of Anthony's. Was that true? Yeah, the and, unstable and DNAs. And still you spanked this in, in the final score. So, yeah, the ability of the carnivores, I think, is overrated in this game. Yeah, I don't think there should be a situation where the herbivores are just mass producing, because that's more a thematic, and the carnivores should always be able to at least feed themselves, just like in nature, to some extent. So there needs to be a little bit of balancing between the cards and some interesting dynamics that go into play, because I think I, a lot of times my cards were just trying to catch up with the defensive cards of the herbivores. Mm -hmm. I love the tableau building. It's really nice to put together a creature from scratch. So you do see a long neck, burrowing, hard shell, you know, fatty tissue with great eyesight. So you get to see a lot of those things. The little downside is, and I understand this is used for game balance, is that you can't have more than three traits per creature. I would really like to see a creature with multiple traits or maybe a situation where, depending on your body size, you could have multiple traits if you hit a certain number. So it just kind of adds the, to the complexity of the creature in the game. It was also difficult when, I think, Drew had horns throughout the whole game. Every single one <laughs> every, of my guys every had. Every Drew's creature had horns. <laughs> so even if you were to attack Drew's creature, you would get damage done to you at the same time, which is also thematic and a lot of fun, but at the same time kind of really held us back to trying to mass produce the herbivores. Um, and Because you're getting a lot of defensive cards. And even if you're not getting defensive cards as far as traits are concerned, you're getting defensive cards which could be added to population or body size, which just by having a very large body size as an herbivore, which was also thematic, it would keep you from getting eaten by a carnivore. I think the game definitely rewards you for having multiple species, because that's when I really ramped up, is when I had like five out. Because then mm -hmm. you get a ton of cards. Mm -hmm. um, and then it's really hard to kill something off, because I can just throw population at you all day long. Um, 
So that's something you learn as you play. But the other part of it too is this is a prototype. This is you know on Kickstarter. These sure. are things that he's probably still tweaking and balancing. I know that I saw somewhere on the forums them talking about reducing um, long neck to just one food at the yeah, beginning of the round, that would... which would not trigger much of anything. Or and if it did, you would have one population. So it's not you don't get that level of um, you can't just pull away like that. So I think is it worth backing? Is this a game that's going to be interesting? Um, as he continues to balance it. I think yes. Um, I think I would be interested in playing this again. Yeah, I don't think the components are going to make it cost very much. Uh, Thirty dollars, maybe. It's fifty. Hmm. It's fifty. Fifty. Yeah. Okay. A I lot take of that wooden back. cubes in the box. Yeah, but they're just plain wooden cubes. Yeah, I don't. Yeah, at a fifty-dollar purchase, I may hesitate. As far as backing this game, I'm hesitant. Uh, it's going to come out already, it's met its funding goals, and it's going to be carried by major distributors. So, as far as getting the game on the market, that's done. At $50, this game feels more expensive than it ought to be. And while I'm sure some of these balance issues will be addressed, right, I can only talk about the version I've played. Uh, if these balance issues are addressed, that will substantially increase the value of the game to me, but even then, I'm not convinced $50 is a fair price for what we're going to be getting. So, I'm in the play or kick back and wait mode. Wait till it hits the market, wait till it hits the stores, see what it looks like then. I'm looking forward to playing this game again. It had a lot of different complexity that... Um, didn't really show until the end of the game how you can kind of put things together. I'd like to see more of a diversity of cards, and obviously, since this is a kind of preview version, the components are not what we're going to see in the final version. But yes, at the $50 price point, it's a little expensive. I know Kickstarter typically kind of throws a little bit in if they can try to help you out with little promos and things like that. So I'm looking forward to seeing a little bit more. The artwork is decent, the components are okay. Um, I might wait until this gets to stores, maybe at a $30, I think as Drew was saying, $30 price point might be something I'd be uh, willing to pick this up at. It's already at 775% funding, so, wow. A lot of stretch goals, I guess, to uh, Yeah, it's to definitely coming that. out, and uh, we'll, we'll touch back to when the retail version hits, and we'll talk about what the final version looks like and if they've addressed those issues we pointed out. Uh, well, the game I've been playing most or wanting to play the most, is uh, Betrayal at the House on the Hill. Uh, Wizards of the Coast uh, put out this game. It's a semi-cooperative horror-themed game where you cooperate up until a specific moment in the game called The Haunt, at which point something bad happens. Bum, bum, bum. <laughs> what it is is going to be randomly determined by a number of factors on the board, um, and getting into it would be a little too involved for a quick review, but... Uh, sometimes it means one player is a traitor and they're turning against you. Sometimes it means every player is trying to kill one another. And sometimes it means that something outside of the players is coming to get them all. Whatever the circumstance is, it usually means only some of the players are going to be able to make it out alive. Now, I absolutely love Betrayal. It is probably my favorite game of the games I own, and it has totally destroyed every game in the surrounding categories for me. So when I look at sort of uh, Eldritch Horror style game, Arkham Horror style games, uh, I just have a really hard time thinking about when I'm ever going to play them if I also own Betrayal. I mean, it does the horror element better in that there's this sort of unknown threat, right? You don't know what it's going to be, you don't know who it's going to be, and even when it happens, the uh, good guys and the bad guys uh, have different information. So they don't, you know, they don't share their understanding of the situation. Sometimes the good guys know how to kill the bad guy, and the bad guy doesn't know how they can be killed. And otherwise, at the same time, the bad guy knows how to destroy the entire building or doom the world and the good guys have no idea why the bad guy is doing what they're doing so the horror of the unexplained and unknowable is, is sort of highlighted there but it's also just very simple the rules are all, are all very straightforward uh, the initial cooperative aspect with that twist at the end where 
probably someone is going to turn against you, but maybe not, and hey, it might be you turning against everyone else. Makes the game very uh, complex and dynamic and exciting because you kind of cheer for someone when they get that powerful suit of armor or that magical amulet that will protect them from darkness. But then there's that little voice in your head saying, well, what if they're the traitor? And then there's that other little voice saying, but what if I'm the traitor? <laughs> <laughs> How do you call this kind of game? It's, it's almost like... Um... Uh, Battlestar Galactica, it's not strictly cooperative, it's quasi-cooperative, semi-cooperative. Yeah, it's like time-limited cooperation. <laughs> the clock is ticking on the cooperation. It's definitely an experienced game, though. I mean, the first time I played it, I hated it. Hated it, hated it, hated it. Because the group I played with just, it wasn't fun. Because mm -hmm. it's not, like, it's not mechanic independent you can't just have fun with the game you have to have fun with the people you're playing with mm, yeah. like if the people you're playing with are uh well i mean it's anytime someone's going to turn coat in any way or if you're going to start playing against each other after being cooperative for a while because let's say you're playing for 30 minutes cooperative and someone's alpha gaming it and then all of a sudden you switch and that guy's the one everybody wants to attack and then it's just i don't know it's so would you recommend that we put this in the drinking game category to relax <laughs> and just have fun with <laughs> I don't know. I don't know about that. I mean, I think it's a good game. I mean, yeah. you look through that book, all the different things that can happen. That's ridiculous. Like, the replayability is off the charts. Yes, it's, yes. it's yes. definitely one of those quintessential Ameritrash games. Yeah, it's really all about theme. You can't think too hard about strategy because you don't know when the haunt's coming out. It could come out right away, mm -hmm. and and you know turn into a fifteen minute game, or it could be you know an hour just kind of walking around in circles oh, looking yeah. picking up stuff so there's a, it's it's challenging in that way because you never know what you're going to get but at the same time it's challenging because you never know what you're going to get some of the scenarios can be broken just uh, so you're aware of that um some of the characters that you have the powers and what you're up against it could take a long time to finally defeat them one game i played was getting close to two hours and finally had to quit but there are so many scenarios though that you know 99 percent of them are going to be very interesting to explore. And even the ones you can break, you have to be in a really specific situation when the haunt happens to break them. So there's one uh, where a giant pterosaur lifts the house off and you all have to rush for the parachutes. Yeah. And my friends and I were playing and we got the haunt on the second omen roll. So we had four rooms open. There were three of us in the room and one of them just grabbed the parachute off the shelf, walked out the door, and the other two of us were... <laughs> So that happened. So we're all going to die, right? Where there, there goes that cooperative aspect, yeah. doesn't it? Yeah. Um, but those are very, you know, few and far between, and most of my experiences playing this game have been absolutely phenomenal. Yeah. You might want to house rule in something like don't let the haunt happen before turn four, or the fourth or fifth omen, uh, because I think it's more fun the bigger house you have. Yeah. Um, it also gets, you know, some of them are... Uh, some of the opponents are really in trouble if you have a small house, right? If you're sure. right next to the monster when it emerges, they take time to build, and it makes it not very fun if you all just gather around the monster and start kicking it in the face as it's trying to claw <laughs> through the floor. Um, but it is one of my favorite games. Uh, before I bought this game, I had the Elder Signs and the expansion to that, and I was really enjoying that. And then I bought Betrayal in the House of the Hill, and I cannot look at it the same way ever again. Elder Signs has sat on my shelf collecting dust ever since I made that purchase because it is it, it moves slower it doesn't seem as just dynamic to me this is a game that has killed games for me it betrayed its comrades <laughs> <laughs> there we go it was cooperative and building this neat this sort of horror game genre right and then it killed all the rest of them yeah dude I thought you were one of us you had the tentacles you had the whole evil stare thing down and yeah you stabbed me in the back What's up with that? <laughs> Who would have thought you, drooling tentacle guy, would be a backstabber? It's... What the heck, man? <laughs> it's kind of ironic, too, because that game's kind of older than all the other ones we talked about. Yeah. I mean, Betrayal's been around for a long time. Mm -hmm. It was, you know, an old Avalon Hill game before Wizards bought Avalon Hill. So it's, I don't know, let's say 10 years old. Wow. Maybe more. But, you know, there's still a lot of people out there that haven't discovered it yet, so it's going to be no, new to them. That's the interesting thing about board games, that we have that conversation, and there's all these games that kind of fade into the distance and nobody thinks about them anymore until someone brings it out. And you're like, holy, this is way better than all this new stuff. I mean, and we were talking about Tabletop a moment ago. That's the place, I think, that brought the sort of resurgence of focus on Betrayal because I had never heard of it, nor did I ever see anyone playing it. And then Tabletop brought an episode of Betrayal, and suddenly it was sold out everywhere. And 
You yeah. Know, a lot of it depends on the storytelling aspects and how much you want to play it up because it does create this noir uh, feeling. So get your, throw yourself into it. Have fun with it. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So let's talk about a nicer destination instead of a house on a hill. How about a hotel in the Samoas? So Hotel Samoa is a very simplistic, fun, kind of sit back and relax Euro game where you are the manager of a hotel and you are dealing with the tourists that are coming in on each flight from different countries. So the game sets up, you have this little kind of board with your hotel on it and you have these number of um, baggage kind of large tokens that kind of make almost like a little bit of a runway and each one of them has a flag of a different nationality. Now, the nationalities will repeat over three times. So what happens is the British are coming. The British are coming. So clearly the British are coming first. So you'll have British tourists come in that first round and they want to have a place to stay. So what you'll be doing to start the game is you'll be picking a card as far as how much you're going to charge for your rooms. And obviously the tourists want to have a good deal. So the lower that you charge the more likely they are to come to your hotel and fill your rooms. But on the other side, how much money you are willing to pay for upgrades and, and improvements to your hotel, which is also another selection of tiles, the more likely you are to build those things that will score you additional bonus points throughout the game. So what's really fun about that is those competing themes are actually on the same card. So if you were going to pay a lot of money to build something which tends to be good it's also going to cost a lot of money for tourists to want to come to your rooms so you know it's it's kind of like you kind of hedge your bets which way should you go at least that round and you're going to have a, a set deck of cards as among which everyone else will have so you will have to play a card at some point throughout the game other than going on vacation which allows you to kind of reset everything that you're doing so you'll score victory points for people that go to your rooms and there'll be like celebrities and lovers that you can put more than one in a room and that you can build a, a pool so you can score victory points off of that. And as the British leave and, and new British come in tourists, you'll be able to kick out the old ones, take in the new ones and score additional points. So there is a set, a set type of strategy as far as when do I build, what tour should I take and what improvements should I add to my hotel that'll battle, that'll benefit me in the long term? So it's a really light, interesting game as far as Euro games are concerned. It's a good gateway game, and no betrayals, so that's always a good thing too. <laughs> yeah, it's very lighthearted and fun um, as long as everybody's playing the game the same way and sure. nobody's freaking out every time someone takes a spot or pulls the tourist they want. Yeah. Um, well, it's a Euro game. I mean, there's there isn't any interaction other than maybe you taking the resources. Um, that I'd, I would ideally want. But beyond that, not too much. The mechanic in it is is one that I, that I truly love because I see it so rarely in uh, board games, the zero-sum game, where everybody has the same number of cards sure. to begin with, and everyone by the end of the game is going to play the same number of cards, the exact same cards. So it's it, it's all about timing. Definitely. Yeah, yeah. it's that, that symmetrical element, but then you can play it however you want, and by the end of the game, it's completely misbalanced but it's based on what you did so you can't get mad at somebody you chose which cards <laughs> to play that's really yeah. it it's it's light game the artwork is really nice the graphic design is is okay um the card quality is decent although i felt that they didn't have enough tokens as far as money's concerned so we constantly had to go back and make made change which is not the end of the world but it is a little bit challenging it was a lot it was kind of annoying yeah well yeah i mean that's a small thing to get annoyed about in a game like this but it it did eat a lot of time it was surprising that they didn't have enough because that you aren't scoring that much money throughout the game so i don't know what the the challenge was there but right now you can this was this game was go, uh, originally selling for about 50 or 60 msrp right now you could probably pick it up for about 5 10 15 bucks online so for a small simple easy euro game that you can play with the entire family it's definitely worth uh picking up yeah i'd say it's a play yeah worth the money you paid <laughs> yeah absolutely okay games i play um one i played a lot recently it's actually one that i've been playing online um because i believe in the whole concept of online games the the try before you buy um to try things out um and this is on yukata uh, dot de and i've been playing can't stop it's a dice game 
It's it's not something new. It's not something fresh, but something I've been playing recently, and I think it's very addictive. Dice games that are addictive are like popcorn. And uh, it's just a matter of, it, it's one of these, um, what do they call those? Where you, where you put, oh, push your luck games. It's a push your luck game, basically. And you have numbers 12 through, or 2 through 12. You got to try and capture three different columns. Uh, if you push your luck, you go back to the beginning. So uh, I played it online on yukata.de, and now I want to get it. It's like, uh, I love it. <laughs> And I encourage people try before you buy. You're gonna you're gonna end up buying a lot more games than you thought. Yeah, is that in print? Um, yes. It. Uh, you did ask me about it being in print. It still is. Um, it's a Sid Saxon game created in 1980, but uh, there are a couple places like Face to Face Games, Card House. Um, you should be able to easily find it uh, online. Uh, the MSRP was 40, but you can find it for 30 or a little less than that. Yep. And there's an app, right? Oh, app for 99 cents. Check it out, iOS. Uh, might be for Android. You can look that up, too. Can't stop. Awesome. I can't stop playing it. Yeah, I love any way you can think of to play a game before you buy it, because you don't want to spend $50 on a board game and find <laughs> out, I'm never going to play this again. Even if you like it, you're like, who would I play this with? It, well, it's the kind of game where you're going to think of people to play it with, and you're going to keep it on hand. Awesome. All right, so that's Can't Stop. Uh, next up, we're going to talk about our feature review for this episode, Lewis and Clark. <laughs> And now for the feature review. All right, this episode we're going to be talking about Lewis and Clark, The Expedition. This is published by Ludonaut, distributed by Asmodee in North America, and it's a first-time designer, Cedric Chabousset. And if I'm saying that wrong, I'm sorry, but uh, it's French. So this game is basically a kind of a mashup of um, area control, worker placement, um, follow the path kind of games. It uses a few different mechanics. It uses them all in relatively unique ways. Um, and it's kind of combines the idea of deck building, but not necessarily in the way a deck builder would. So let's walk through it real quick and you'll understand what all that means together. Um, when you start, you're going to set out this board, you're going to put out um, a deck of cards, and then there will be a tableau of cards available for purchase. There are five available for purchase at any time. Um, there is a village that takes up about, I don't know, 50% of the board in the middle. This is your worker placement area, and these are specific actions you can take throughout the game in addition to the actions that the cards let you take. Um, everybody's going to get one deck of starting cards, and they're all the same, but they are different characters. And that's one of the cool things about the game. Every name, character, animal on each of these cards um, is a real person. And there's actually a pretty cool um, little appendix in the back of the rule book that tells you who all of them are along with what the cards do because it's incredibly iconography heavy this is one of those games you'll be referencing the book every turn as you pull out new cards you need to see what the actual icons mean but you can also kind of go along with the story here there's a lot of history to the game so once you get everybody gets their um starting deck and you lay out all your tokens and you lay out all your resources you're going to start with three resources um you you pick who plays it plays first at random, and then the first turn you're going to be laying down, um, and you'll be doing this every turn, but you'll be laying down a card of your choice, and that card, whatever the action is on the card, you'll be able to perform, but you also have to spend a resource to activate the card. There's two ways to do this. You can either turn over another card, and on the back it'll show between one and three Indians, or you can use one of the Indians you have on your player board. Um, and you, everybody starts with one, and later you can get more by recruiting with your interpreter. So you can use a card for its uh, resource or for its action. If you use it for its action, um, the ones with the better actions, the more powerful actions, tend to be worth more resources. So it might be a three-resource card and do an incredibly good action, but maybe you want to use the three resources because if you spend more resources for an action, you get to do that action multiple times. So by default, you spend one to activate the card, you do it once. If you spend three to activate the card and it gives you um, some kind of resource in return, you get three times that. And this is where it gets really interesting. There's an icon in the top of the card. If you match that to however many are on the board, so let's say it's the pelt icon and you play the card that lets you take pelts and you play two resources. Before you calculate how many resources you're going to get, you look around the board at everybody's cards and you see how many of those gold pelt icons are out. So if Daniel has two and Chris has one and Drew has two and I have one, 
then you're going to get six times two, because you played two resources, you can have up to 12 um, pelts, which sounds amazing, except you have limited space to store these on your player board, and there are penalties. So anything more than the basic three resources that you can carry, um, if you, at the end of your deck, basically, um, when you start running out of cards, you can camp. And when you camp, if you have too many resources on your board and too many Indians on your board and too many cards in your hand, you're going to move back spaces on this track. So let's say you moved up 10 spaces over the course of your, of, you know, multiple turns in this round. Um, but you have, you know, eight extra resources sitting there. You're going to move back based on that about six spaces. So you only really gained four. Um, so there's a lot of, you move up, you move back, you move up, you move back. The key then is to figure out how to time it so that you run out of resources, you run out of cards at the exact right moment, and then you camp so you lose as little space as possible. And that requires you to plan ahead for all of the cards you play, but you can't plan everything because other people might play cards that affect you. So let's say you hold your pelt card till your last turn, but there are now seven out on the board and that's the only card you have to play you're kind of in trouble because when you play it, you're going to draw a ton of pelts because there are so many other resources out there. It's very unique in that way. You're balancing what other people are doing. You're balancing what you're doing. Um, you have a ton of options at any time. It's got that deck builder idea to it because you're going to, you're buying new cards. You're buying, you're recruiting new people from the board, but you can play from your hand openly. So you don't have to shuffle back in and draw five cards. You can play any card you have at any time. Um, once it's on the table, it's not available until you camp again. That's the one interesting part there. But let's say you buy your really awesome card one turn, you can play it the next turn. So everything, every decision you make is going to matter. Um, later in the game, this does lead to a little bit of AP. It does bog down a little because the number of options increases so dramatically. But overall, um, the way everything plays together is very tight. It's very well balanced, with the exception of one card that we found. This game, everything works really well together, and everybody's pretty much on the same page um, in terms of what they're available to do throughout the game. I like it a lot. I think it's one of the more unique games of the year, and uh, excited to talk about it. What do you guys think? Well, yeah, as you were saying, there's that one card, and... Uh... So quite unlike the real adventures of Lewis and Clark, if you want to make this game play smoothly and successfully, you have to kill Sacagawea. <laughs> Folks, Daniel broke the game. It's what he does. It's what it's he does. how I roll. Um, Sacagawea is just way too powerful. She lets you use worker placement places without placing workers there, and you can use them multiple times per round if you give multiple resources to her to do so. And... This allowed me to, I think, by turn two, own almost every canoe. And there are a limited number of canoes which allow you to hold additional Indians. Also, side note, this game is slightly racist. Little. All the Indian meeples are dark red and have a feather. And they refer to the various distinct tribal groups with which Lewis and Clark interacted all as... Indians, quote unquote. It it treats it treats the natives, to me felt like the way the Westerners treat Sherpas when they climb Everest. They're just there to do our menial work. Um, they try to correct that by by giving them characters. There are a number of Indian characters, Native American characters that you can add to your expedition, and they have good powers like Sacagawea. But overall, it's just like uh, they're the grunt laborers of the game. And it would have been good for the game to have her as one of the main characters you could play as because you get one of these characters. So whatever color you get, you have a character that has some little text about what they did or who they were. So why not have her as one of the characters leading the expedition because clearly these other people did not. So if you're going to open up this history to other possible explorers that were along why not her as well and that would have kind of helped out at least a little bit on that side and definitely what they're trying to capture with Sacagawea being this powerful was her significance to the expedition the problem is that the way the card is built in this game it lets you gather all of the only limited resources on the board the canoes and the the resource rafts and you can buy these for three wood each 
uh, and there is a small pile of them. And if you buy them fast enough, that means no one else gets to have these additional spaces to store resources without penalty and these additional spaces to store uh, Indians without penalty. And that makes a huge difference in the long run. In, it's just one card. Um, there's a similar card to it that doesn't have quite the power, and that's that's okay. But, you know, you be, should be able to find workarounds, limit the number of times that card can be used or whether you even want to use it. What The reason why we make such a big deal about it is because otherwise the game is really balanced. Um, it's very hard for one player to get so far ahead that the others can't catch up. We were We were bunched up close to each other about three-quarters of the way through. Um, The only thing is the game can end very quickly. Um, That one player can get uh, enough resources to move enough spaces to win suddenly. So by the time you're all bunched up near the end, you're watching each other. Yeah, but at the same time, uh, when that happens, they've been planning for it for like six turns. Because you can't just bam, bam, bam in one turn because you can only take one action per turn. Like, the action is required. You can't pass on your action, but you can only do one. So... Let's say I'm like, oh, I need to buy that card because it has a resource I need. That's my turn. Wait for everybody else to go. Okay, now I need the resource. Okay, that's my turn. Wait for everybody else to go. Okay, now I'm going to spend the resource to convert to another resource that I need to move. Okay, that's my turn. Like, four turns just to get the one resource and then do the movement. That's it. I'd fallen way behind in the game, but uh, at some point I was able to play my resources where I got 12 spaces in one shot and caught up to everybody. So that's what happens. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's... At the beginning of the game, I'd say the first eight turns or so, I jumped out maybe 15, 20 spaces, like right to the foot of the mountains. Everybody else was still back in St. Louis. By the time I actually started moving through the mountains, everybody else had caught up with me because <laughs> it takes that long. And that's one of the interesting parts, too, is that most of the way you're on the river, and so you're using one type of movement, um, which is either boats or buffaloes. And I don't get the buffalo part, but you can use buffalo to move down the water. I don't know why. But when you, you, ride to, on, you ride on the back of the buffalo. They're water, <laughs> water buffalo. Yeah, they water. float. <laughs> they float really well. Uh, but then, once you get to the mountains, you need a different type of resource to get over the mountains, which is usually the horse. Uh, horses are very hard to get. There are a couple cards that can... Like, there's one that converts canoes to horses. There's another one that allows you to convert pelts to horses. There was another one that allowed you to convert Indians to horses. Um, which I ended up getting eventually. And then there's a spot on the board where you can convert any three different resources into horses. All of those are hard to get, and you're going to need like five, six horses to get through the two sets of mountains that there are. Um, So if you don't plan for that and you run to the base of the mountains, then you're going to sit there for five, six, seven, eight, ten turns while everybody else catches up. Yeah, this game does not allow you to to set up a a resource-producing engine where you just chug out everything you need to keep moving. It forces you to change... From still water to white water, back to still water to white water, you're, you're constantly, and that is what allows other people to catch up. Yeah, the transition from river to mountain is, is really, I think, a, a very clever point for this game, because otherwise it would run very quickly, and it would be just a simple engine would get you where you needed to go. Yeah. But with the need to transition the, the output, right, you have to get a different sort of resource to move over the mountains. It means it can totally derail a strategy that is effective early game, right? Yeah. We also um, talked when we were playing uh, about getting more characters. Um, There's a constant stream of characters that we can add to our hand um, that gives us powers, and yet that can be a drawback in the long run. Yeah, Um, because if you end up with too many cards, like say you get to the end, you've passed the fort and you want to camp, but let's say you camped recently and now there's nine cards in your hand. If you camped right now, you go back nine spaces, so you can't camp until you burn those cards. And there is one space on the board you can place to burn cards, but then there's only one space to burn cards. So, yeah, having too many cards in your hand is dangerous. Well, one one question I have for you guys is, this game has been getting a lot of attention as a historic game, right? I don't think that label fits here. No. There is nothing about the gameplay which is historically rooted, right? This is no more historical than civilization. It's historical in that it has pictures of famous people from the past, and at most... There's this little uh, the booklet. little blurbs, maybe yeah. three or four sentences long at the longest, describing these historical figures. But but there's nothing about the game mechanics or the game play that teaches you any lesson about this period in history, right? Yeah, all these wonderful characters, both native and um, uh, Anglo, and yet the little bio blurbs have nothing to do with the powers uh, that those characters have. It's just incidental. 
Well, to be fair, I mean, one of the, one of the great parts of this game is is it felt for to me be very thematic. So you were yeah. starting on this expedition. You need to have certain resources in order to get through. You need certain people. So maybe if there is any historical content that can be looked upon for this game was that it required all, all of these historic characters in addition to, in a, not even just an addition, but, be, but because the Native Americans were there, the early American settlers were able to explore this land, and if without them, they wouldn't be able to. So maybe for us, as far as we're looking at them as workers and we're looking at them as, you know, resources and things that we can put into play, but maybe for a new gamer or a younger gamer who's going, yeah, I'm this cool guy and I could just, you know, get over there because that's what we do. That's America. But when you play this game, you're going, I need, you know, a number of Native Americans to help me in order to to be able to do these actions, to move across these lands, to get resources, because it turns out that there was not long ago, a, you know, a time in history where we were not this massive economic industrial engine that just could, could plow through things, that we did need the support of these, you know, natives that could that understood the land, understood of a way of living that we had no idea about and without which we would have not survived in the new world. So for me, it gave me that kind of sense of this is their land and we're just guests and visitors here. And through their generosity, we were able to explore and create a great nation. So Chris, the bottom line is, would you say that this is a, a worthwhile game for schools to purchase perhaps or families for their children i think so i think in your junior high school high school level um age where because you're you know even when you're getting penalized because you have too many people in your boats or too many resources which i think is also tremendously thematic it only pushes you back a little bit so if everybody is at that same skill level they'll eventually catch on to the fact that I should only have these people at these times and these resources at these times. And I think it balances its 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 gameplay really well as far as that way. Yeah. It's family friendly. That's for sure. It's complicated if you want to talk about junior high sure. enough, but not younger. It's, it's interesting. So I, I would not think it's appropriate for an educational setting. That's that, at least from my point of view. The only thing that seemed like the lesson I seem to get from it, if you wanted to pull a historic lesson, would be if you put yourself in the mindset of the white expedition leaders at the time, the way that they objectify the Indian laborers, right, and use them as an expendable resource and are willing to sacrifice them to get certain jobs done. That seems historically accurate for that time period's views of the relationship between those those groups. American, but, American Sherpas. And I wouldn't disagree. I mean, I, I agree with you, and I pointed that out when we were playing the game as far as them being resources and the colors of the meeple. So I, I do think that there is some cultural sensitivity that's not put into good practice here. But just by what you're saying is, while they were being used, at the same time, the game does, you know, the cards that do come up with the Native Americans that you can add to your expedition, there are given texts, they are treated as regular people like everybody else. They, they have names, they have interesting information about them. And they're not, at least not in this game, and considering games that there are <laughs> meeples that are sacrificed, they're not sacrificed, right? So, you know, it's not like you need they to... They always go back to the village. Yeah, yeah, they don't get killed off. Because there are some games where you're sending adventurers off and as cannon fodder. So these guys are like, you you know how to climb the mountain, so come with me. Now I don't need you to climb the mountain, so head back to the village, and I'm going to take somebody else who knows how to deal with the waters. And that's fair enough. I just... While I see that there there is a historical theme here, I don't see that, that any of the lessons that should be imparted by that theme are carried in the mechanics themselves. Yeah, sure, the moving back with the cargo, that seems appropriate, but that's more about like how to travel downriver than it is about the historic period in which this is supposed to take place. Uh, yeah, it just seems to me that the gameplay doesn't communicate the theme terribly well, at least the historical aspect of the theme. Well, we, we would probably say that you do need the Native Americans in order to win this game, at least at least the, the, the worker meeple people, right? If, if not just, if not only the cards as well. That would also be additionally helpful. I guess the, the question is, and, and the sensitivity that we both, that, that could be taught is, 
these people were brought so much to our ability to understand the new world and yet at the same time they were objectified and used in a way that wasn't mm -hmm. in keeping with the generosity that they they brought us and then allowed us to do all these things so both at the same time as you're saying so a, the, my question there is how much of that is from the game and how much of that is from us giving meaning to a game that did not give it to us right we're just well, saying here's the historical meaning sure but you can't you can't you can't win the game. You can't play the game without the Native American meeples, right? Without or, using them. Without using them. Even without without the little uh, feather in, in the uh, meeple, you can't win the game without that. Yeah. Um, we've talked a lot about the historical perspectives of games. Uh, the next broadcast, we're going to be playing Freedom and talking about that. That probably ups the ante on that. Just how do we mm -hmm. feel about our history and how does this game treat a sensitive part of America's history? Yeah. So we got that to look forward to. Absolutely. So Anthony, is we know that you picked this game up. So do you still feel this is a buy, a play, or a dodge? Um, I think it's a definitely a play. I think it's a strong game. I think mechanics are very well done. The game is well designed. Um, I feel the same mild discomfort you're describing, Daniel, in terms of like how it plays these things out. I don't think a ton of thought was put into it in that way by the designer. Um, I think probably at least some was just the way it's laid out and like who is the most powerful cards and what they do and what they allow you to do and I don't feel like it's sending people off or spending them as resources. I think they are helping you and once they've helped you they go back to their lives. That's how I felt thematically. But at the same time it's not this rich historical um, if the book didn't do what it did you would have no context for any of this and it's not in the game. There's no like flavor text to the, to the cards either. It's not necessary. Um, but that all said, uh, I did enjoy the game a lot. I thought the game was really well made. And the way it combines different types of resources and different types of mechanics, um, and it's so tightly packed. You pull the Sacagawea card out, it's very fun. It's very well designed. Uh, I can't imagine teaching this to anybody under, let's say, 12 or 13, where they would follow it. But uh, And then at that point, how much context you need to give somebody. But... I would say it's a strong play, maybe a buy, if you play it and enjoy it. Um, I'm happy to have picked it up. I don't know that I would have bought it if I'd played it first, you know, somewhere else. But uh, I'll definitely play it again. So I think it's something that will come out more than once because it is so unique in the way it plays. And um, I would like to see, you know, a few more of the card combinations and if, how the game plays without Sacagawea. <laughs> uh, so, yeah, I'm in between on this one, but strong play. I tend to rate games by how often I'd want to play it. Um, this this is something I would certainly would still be fresh every couple of months. I wouldn't because you burn through all the character cards, so there's not really a lot of playability, replayability. There's nothing new except in the combination of cards that comes out. Um, I would play it every couple of months, though. I certainly would, you know, get get some usage out of that, but not more than that. For me, it's, it's definitely a play. I liked it as soon as we started to put all the pieces out, the cards, the artwork was nicely designed. The graphic design is, is interesting. It definitely fits pretty well. I like how the cards are that double-sided so that you can see how many actions you'll get to play. And on the other side, the artwork and the iconography is not too bad. I mean, we did have to refer back to the rule book several times but at least we could kind of make out some things once in a while, so it wasn't like a constant problem. Um, as we you know, said throughout the review, the one glaring kind of issue was I don't know why they decided to go with the, you know, the dark red colored meeple for the Native Americans. It just seems so obvious, and I maybe I don't, it just boggles my mind why they went there. Um, I, I, I have to assume they did that purposely because it's, it's not a usual meeple color that's, you know, some, maybe you'll see a black, white, red, green, yellow meeple, but that's a unique color. And I, I'm sure they, they were trying to do something to kind of, you know, help there, but I, I think it does, it, it was just like, we put them out there. I'm like, that can't, no, I mean. It, the feather didn't even bother me as much as the color did. Because the feather is like, all right, I understand you wanted to do something different to distinguish this, even though you could have just done a general meeple as well. But being the fact that your explorers had their own kind of custom design, you had to do something different. So I don't 
the feather's not killing me, but the color is just, I don't I, understand why. I think we're just too sensitized to the issue because of the, the controversy surrounding the name of the football team, the Washington Redskins. That's been a big deal lately. Yeah, but it, it's just, as the game goes, when you are the creator of this universe and you could decide any color, any shape, any object, it didn't have to, to go that far. As I said, it's not it's not egregious, but at the same time, it's it's a, maybe a little bit troubling. Well, it, and there, there's the difficult balance between finding an identifiable uh, prototype of a group of individuals, sure. right, and an offensive stereotype, right? Because you're abstracting away from details of individuals to get to something that represents everyone. But in doing that, you have to resort to these really general traits, which is exactly what you do when you make racist caricatures, sure. right? And it's it's a difficult line to walk. Yeah. I think we're blowing it out of proportion. The The game went to great lengths to create a very specific, clearly defined individual Native Americans in their character cards. Um, I think that's that's more important. And that was my other point, that as far as does this, give, this game have some historical standing to it, I think the fact that the cards were named with their actual names and that there was text available at least, yeah. it should have definitely been on the card. I don't see why it wasn't on the card even if it was just a one-line, you know, um, blur in there. But um, otherwise, the game plays well. It's an interesting mechanic because I always like tableau, uh, you know, building a tableau as far as special unique powers and trying to gauge what powers I need when and to not overburden myself with too many cards or too many resources. So the game does have replayability as far as depending on the cards that you choose will be your strategy at least for at least for a part of the time and we did have we were pretty close at the end i think we were all between you know one round or two rounds of of winning the game until anthony played that one move where he leaped and he ahead. leaped overhead <laughs> but uh it's a great game i definitely would play this again and uh i think it has something to offer um both gamers and people interested in the lewis and clark kind of travels if you like something new, something fresh, the the two sided cards. Two sided cards about are great. That. Awesome, they're I'll, awesome. There's was, so much important detail on both sides relating to gameplay. Yeah, and you have that little board in front of you, which is nice because it easily maintains everything. So, uh, so the two sided cards, I really like them. That yeah. was a nice way to incorporate a complex mechanic onto the things you get to hold in your hand, right? Uh, though we did still have to reference the rule book a lot which indicates that there was just a lot of stuff going on there. Uh, this is not generally my favorite kind of game, though I do enjoy them. Uh, and also, rumors of its historicity have been greatly exaggerated, in, in my opinion. That's true. Um, I put this on the boundary between play and dodge. Uh, if you have time and nothing else to do, and this is the game that's available to you, you won't be wasting your time by playing it. But I don't know that playing it's going to be the best choice available to you if you have other options there. Uh, for me, it's on the lower end of play. It's unoffensive, but it's also not particularly satisfying or appealing to me. All right, so that is our full review of Lewis and Clark, The Expedition. Next episode, we're going to be talking about freedom, so kind of carrying along this semi-historical... Freedom! <laughs> ...vein. Um, and that's going to be, like... Like Drew, like what you were saying, upping the ante a little bit in terms of yeah. the historical and the uh, social, you know, implications of the game itself. Um, but that's everything for this week. Obviously, you should check out our website. We got a lot of new articles coming up from all four of us, um, and we're recording this a little bit in advance because of the holidays. So by the time you hear it, there should be a good number of articles up on the site since our last episode. Uh, you can also follow us on Twitter. Well, we'll be posting any updates we have. Um, that's at BGA Podcast. We're on Facebook, Board Gamers Anonymous there. And uh, we have the uh, Board Gamers Anonymous Guild on uh, Board Game Geek. And, of course, now a member of the Dice Tower Network. So just tell us what you've been playing, what you've been buying. Uh, we want to hear, too. We get excited about what you guys do. All right, so that's everything for this week. This is Anthony. This is Chris. This is Daniel. This is Drew. And until next time, we'll save you a seat at the table. Alrighty, guys. Uh, so we should probably start digging through the rules for freedom now. Freedom! Freedom! You've got time.